Thanks for having me, Matt. Um, so just a quick poll, how many entrepreneurs in the room? How many people working at startups? How many people from Bloomberg? Oh, wow, all right. Um, cool, so I think, you know, my talk's gonna, it's sort of two talks. Um, talk a little bit about sort of more the product side of data, right, and sort of use kind of us as an example. And then for those of you who are entrepreneurs or work at startups, I'll talk a lot about, um, kind of some lessons of, that we've learned building a data company. So um, my name is Anand, I run a company called CB Insights. Um, some of you hopefully know us, we're here in New York City, uh, proud to be in New York. So uh, that's us, so you know, kind of real like the highlights, right? So we're in 5,000 this year, backed by the NSF, so that's the only money we've taken. And so I'll walk you through a little bit about what we're doing with the NSF and sort of what kind of problems we're trying to solve. Um, we are revenue funded, uh, you know, kind of uh, growing quickly this year. So this is sort of our big thesis and our big focus is on what, we, what we're saying sort of is what's next, right? And so we are very data driven. We are a data company, obviously. Um, and so the idea really behind a lot of what we're doing is this idea that probability trumps punditry, especially in the business world. And so what we see in the business world uh, or you see it in other domains rather, so political forecasting, professional sports, have sort of adopted predictive analytics and used it to make better decisions. The business world really hasn't, right? So when you think about the big decisions that big businesses make, you know, who should we acquire, who's our next customer, uh, you know, what emerging companies are important for us to track, what's Google doing next, what's Goldman Sachs up to, right? Those are very sort of intuition-driven decisions that are made today. Right? And so we're trying to balance kind of, you know, it's not to remove intuition, that's a, sort of a fool, foolish task, but try to balance that, right? So these are some of the questions we're trying to answer and we think we can do it with data. So we'll kind of walk you through some of the ways we're doing that. Um, so today, the way we make decisions is this, right? Is uh, you, and I, I went to Wharton's uh, undergrad so I can kind of I'm allowed to do this a little bit. Um, so, you know, whether it's management consulting or analyst firms or just sundry advisors that are out there, it tends to be, um, you know, you go to big consulting company, neophyte MBA gets tasked with something, they call some expert network and interview a bunch of experts and then they report that back to the client, right? So that's sort of the way things work right now. And so I think we think there's a way to, to balance this out a little bit um, and so decisions get made like this, right? And again, I want to emphasize this point around this idea of predictive analytics not being a replacement for human judgment and human intuition, but a way to balance it, right? A way to challenge and augment sort of some of those, some of those activities that we have to make decisions on on a pretty regular basis in our work. So kind of some of the things that we're working on, right? So a couple of last week, we worked with the New York Times on trying to predict the next unicorns, right? And so again, how do you use data to do that, right? So how do you look at signals that companies give off, whether it's hiring of key executives, whether it's mobile app traffic, or mobile app download growth, whether it's sentiment in social media. So how do you use different signals? And then how do you determine which signals are relevant to which companies, right? So a consumer technology company Twitter sentiment and Twitter chatter mean something if you are a B2B enterprise SaaS company, less of a relevant signal, right? But then how do we discern partnerships and customer acquisition and do other things? So, you know, this is one example of kind of how do you figure out what's next from a, from a company perspective? Um, you know, kind of this idea of money ball, right? So this is kind of why combinators, unicorns, uh, I have to, whenever I speak at something, I have to use that phrase a lot. Um, so this is kind of stacking them up, right? And so what we see is, um, you know, with, with private companies, the challenge is that it's very hard to understand them. So I used to work at American Express, and we ran into this problem of what you call thin file companies, companies that don't have any credit history. So a couple of years ago at, at CB Insights, we were talking to a payroll company, and we were trying to get, obviously, the best deal possible from them. They came back and said, hey, listen, on our credit scoring system, you guys are one step above bankrupt, right? And so we said, you know, I can assure you we really aren't. 
but they said, you know, hey, listen, we use one of the legacy credit bureaus, and because you guys have no credit history, we can't give you a better deal than we're giving you. Um, and so that leads to private companies like ours and, and probably many of yours potentially having a lot less opportunity, right? You end up getting less desirable rates, banks don't talk to you, you don't get credit from vendors, uh, you know, investors and acquirers may not spot you when they should. So how do we take other signals that, and try to determine how a private company is doing? And so we look at kind of what we talk about is three M's. We look at the quality of the market you're in or the industry. So how do you sort of judge the quality of a, of a market, right? It's a hard problem. How do you look at, you know, the quality of the investors, the quality of the acquirers in that space? Is that market growing from a job and hiring perspective? What's sentiment on that space? So we're looking at the market score, then we look at things like money. So if you have raised investment, you know, from who? Uh, who, you in, who? Who is your investor? It matters. Uh, you know, what's your burn rate? So we look at, you know, what market you're in, how big is your team? We try to assess, you know, how much money you're sort of, you're, you're spending. Um, and then finally, momentum. So momentum is kind of what I talked about earlier, which is, you know, social media to partner customer signings to, uh, you know, executive turnover to are you hiring salespeople? You know, it's a sign of scaling, right? So how do we look at dis different signals to try to determine which companies are doing well and then conversely which ones are not? So trying to get around that sort of thin file problem that I talked about with regards to the credit bureaus. And what's interesting here is, you know, I don't think we're going to be a replacement for uh, the DNBs and experience of the world. You know, we're sort of actually doing pilots with them to see if we can integrate our data into their risk models, right? So I think there's some interesting ways to take this other non-traditional data and layer it into sort of legacy models that people are using. Um, you know, who's your next acquisition, right? So again, like how do we, this is something we're sort of playing around with right now. How do you use data around, you know, if you look at all of the articles that Intel is mentioned in, can you use topic modeling to figure out what their strategic areas of focus are? And then as a result, suggest companies that they might, they should think about acquiring, right? So another sort of hard problem we're sort of in, you know, version 0 0.5 of the algorithm behind sort of potential acquirers. But again, one of those big messy problems that today is very pundit driven, right? It's, it's relationship oriented and, you know, again, we're going to augment that. I don't think it's a replacement. The next hot market, right? So I think the way we approach this is sort of our approach from a couple of years ago, which was could we just follow the money, right? So can you just look at where the money is going and see how that's shifting? And if, I, if, I, if this was interactive, what you'd actually see is there'd be a big dark blue mass. If we push back to like 08 to 2010, there'd be two really big masses. It'd be social and gaming, right? So this is sort of in Facebook and, and Zynga ascendancy days. And then as you fast forward to today, you see some other sectors that are emerging, right? So that was kind of our version one of like, hey, how do we determine which spaces are hot, right? Then we said, okay, we think we can do other, fa we can bring in other factors to identify emerging industries. So can we look at the money? Can we look at media sentiment? Can we look at chatter, uh, you know, the size and quality of investors and acquirers and a whole bunch of other dimensions and then kind of stack rank essentially a bunch of different industries and highlight for folks which ones are doing well. And, and really the goal is if you are an investor or if you're in corporate strategy or an in innovation, you know, how do we identify the industry before it's everybody's talking about it, right? So how do you find those inflection points in kind of the, the market mosaic of a, of a company? So that's kind of the idea behind, uh, behind sort of identifying the next hot market, which is one of the problems we're hopefully tackling. Um, you know, your next customer. So this is something, and I'll talk about this in the next part when I talk about sort of mistakes or lessons learned, right? How do we, if you, you know, if you upload a list of your customers to us, we can actually tell you who else we think you should sell to, right? So using sort of a similar company engine. But these are otherwise, you know, we, we had a funding announcement. It was a small, the NSF funding a couple weeks ago. I've been tracking it. So we've gotten 143 inbound emails from salespeople. Right? They are all, with the exception of two, are all just terrible. Right? Like they show zero understanding of our business, just like just horrendous. Right? Uh, and you know, but how would, you know, how can you augment and make their outreach and efforts more intelligent using data? So kind of, who is your next customer using data? You know, I don't think we've met a CEO yet who says, I have too many leads, right? Like, we, that person doesn't exist, right? So how do we augment that? 
And then what's next for your competitors? So we if this kind of uh, we call the business social graph, right? So this is looking at some of the big players in financial services and where are they investing, right? And so if you can map their investments, their acquisitions, their partnerships, their product announcements, and look at kind of you know where they're investing, what you start to see is this is kind of this overall view, and then this is Goldman specifically, and so. I didn't pull in the JP Morgan one, but what you see here is like, you know, Goldman's one just super active, but they're making bets in digital currency, lending, um, you know, personal financial management. When you compare that, to, for instance, to JP Morgan, you, don't, you see JP Morgan has sort of avoided the digital currency space, right? They're not doing anything in blockchain or Bitcoin, um, you know, uh, like Goldman is, right? So here you start to see kind of some of those nuances in terms of strategy that, that companies are are uh, employing. So that's kind of, you know, some of the problems that we think we can tackle with data. So I'm going to now switch, switch gears to kind of the lessons learned, right? And so I think I, I am reticent to always do talks like this because these, this is not general advice, right? Your mileage will definitely vary. This will work for maybe some enterprise B2B data companies, but just take it with a grain of salt. Um, so I, just, I, I'm curious, do any of you get our newsletter? Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Um, so this, our biggest learning, actually, our newsletter has grown really quickly, and it's been a big marketing thing. And I, Evan had a great, you know, in his talk about people don't talk about marketing, so I'm going to be one of those weird nodes in that, that graph. Uh, um, but we changed our newsletter earlier this year, where we kind of started talking with less jargon, right? I, when we started the company, thought like, you know, we have to say leverage and synergy and like talk like that all the time. And it was just really a terrible newsletter. And then we just started talking kind of the way we talk in our hip chat, you know, at work. Um, and it actually has led to a big sort of adoption. So I think if you're doing some crazy data thing that's really difficult, I, you know, I think people still like to talk like people. So that's been our big lesson there. Um, do not be the low cost provider. Like just do, like again, I'm going to be very emphatic about these this advice, but you know your mileage may vary. We started at some ridiculously low price. Like, just don't do that. Um, uh, you know, data and content are great for attention. So if you can use your data, you know, I think what Evan did with the the data driven talks, right? Like that alone is a great you know marketing kind of engine. So I think use your data to build you know, uh, to build expertise and to get press, right? So we've been quoted a lot for our data, um, and that's just because we've spent a lot of time kind of building it out. Um, my favorite quote from Fred Wilson ever, um, be your own bitch. Um, so we, every time we have licensed data from other people, the rules have always changed, so we don't do that anymore, right? We build our own, we get our own data. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, and it's not, you know, it, they didn't screw us over. They have a business to run. They decided to change the rules, so we have to abide by those rules. But I think that's a, a challenge that, um, you know, now that we've been burned a couple times by some big companies that, you know, made a strategic decision to go in a different direction, we no longer build in other people's sandboxes, right? We're going to go get the data ourselves, um, and that's, you know, it's slower. It's a little bit more of a deliberate course, but it has been... Uh, much better for us. We control the data quality. We're not sort of, there's no supply chain risk, for lack of a better term, as a data company, which is nice. Um, so I think this is the other big thing, right? A big lesson initially, you know, it was, uh, used to go and sell features, right? And I think for us, like what our learning was is what we actually sell is two things. We sell looking good in front of your boss or your customer or getting out of work early. Like, that's really what we sell. Data is sort of the enabler of it. And it took us a while to figure that out, right? I think we used to go in and, like, you know, try to do the, the feature demo, and that is not what people buy it for. They buy it for what problem it solves. Um, so the God algorithm, right? So, like, Mosaic, which is that private company score, is a really... It's tough to sell that, um, especially right out of the gates, right? I think if people don't know who you are and you come out and say, hey, I can predict X, Y, and Z really well with this score, um, it's a really tough sell. So I think you, know, you have to build trust and credibility. You have to uh, give visibility into the drivers. I think that was a big lesson for us. We kind of came out guns blazing and saying, hey, this algorithm will solve you know, X problem. Just use the score and you'll be on your way. 
Um, it doesn't work like that. Um, oh, God, yeah. Um, so big companies will come to you. If you're a startup here, they'll come to you and say, hey, we don't have any money, but we want to do a partnership. And like they'll use terms like joint value creation. Like You should just run fast from these things. They're just always a waste of time. If a big company doesn't have money to put behind the effort, then you have a window shopper on your hands, and you should just say, hey, thanks. You know, When you guys get budget, let's chat. Um, and then sort of similar distribution partnerships sound good, but they almost never work. Finally, listen to your customers. We built a product called CB Insights for sales. I used to work in venture and M&A, never don't know, didn't know anything about sales. Customers basically told us, hey, we think we, we want you to build a product that does X. Um, you know, I could have been sort of obstinate, and we could have been obstinate as a company and not done that, but sort of listen to them and, you know, it's sort of working out well. So that's kind of it. Um, uh, yeah, you know, if you want the presentation or whatever, just ping us on, on social media. But thank you. Great, thank you. Terrific. Um, I'm curious about the long-term vision. Um, so the world of venture-backed companies, so that's dirty data, that's hard to get data, but the data is still out there. Is part of the idea to eventually become, you know, in reference to this beautiful place, the, the, the Bloomberg for private company information, meaning are you going to go into um, the world of private companies outside of venture? Yeah, so I think, you know, Bloomberg for private companies, I think, was always sort of the initial vision. Um, so I think, you know, expanding our footprint outside of that is one thing. I, you know, I really think of us more, to some degree, going after, like, McKinsey, right? So if you think about McKinsey services as a pyramid, there's sort of that bottom layer, which is sort of, you know, what are my competitors doing and where are markets going that we think we can do better with data. Um, and I think that you know, scales across, you know, a bunch of big organizations who are always looking into insights into where industries are going, what their competitors are doing. So I think that's where we see just a, a much bigger opportunity, ultimately. Great. And um, just out of personal slash professional curiosity, so, so you did all of this um, with no outside money, which is remarkable um, and fairly rare, and a lot of people think it just cannot be done. Um, I guess what were the trade offs? How did you how did you pull that off initially? I mean, did you do some consulting on top of the while you were building the product, and did you step by step? Yeah, so we did uh, we did consulting in the beginning to the hedge fund industry on the credit card space, which is where me and my co-founders kind of grew up. We put away we got you know we got lucky right after the mortgage crisis. People wanted a credit card research product, and we were the only game in town. Uh, we had eighteen months where. It was really good, and then we knew that product didn't have a shelf life, so it was going to die. Uh, we put away enough money to build CBI, and then you know we've just been focused on being uh, efficient, right? So we put away more money every month than we spend. Um, and yeah, this year has been a big growth year for us. You know, we've kind of more than doubled the headcount from 24 to 53, I think, as of today, and, and we'll be kind of 70-ish by end of year. And to that point, what, what does a data company like yours look like? Is that you know, how many people are engineers, data scientists versus sales people? Yeah, so, um, so of that 53, 20 is engineering data science. Um, it was predominantly that, you know, sales was two people at the beginning of the year. It's now 15, right? So that we're, we're scaling uh, kind of the outreach and, and biz dev efforts. So that's sort of a new phenomenon. And then we do, for those of you who get the newsletter, you know, that's a free thing, but that's our marketing. So our, um, you know, we just hired somebody from Business Insider to kind of head up our research and content efforts. So that's another sort of fast-growing part of, of the organization. But yeah, biz dev and, and uh, engineering and data science are, you know, 35 out of the 50 plus. Very cool. So I'm going to open up to, to questions, but just one last one. I thought the, the, the part on um, the fact that you don't sell data, but you sell solutions is particularly insightful, and that's uh, just uh, by virtue of talking to a lot of people in the data sort of startup space, uh, there's always a little bit of a disappointment around, you know, we have great data, whether that's raw data or slightly less than raw data, and we'll sell it to people for millions of dollars. And then there's always this moment of where, you know, reality strikes and yeah. nobody wants to buy the data or, or people want to buy data for very small amounts of money. And, uh, and what you said, you know, um, 
so selling solutions or even it's like selling emotions, like coming home early um, or uh, looking good in front of your boss. I think that's exactly it. It sounds simple, but it's so fundamentally true. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing, you know, we thought, because we're sort of data geeks, we thought, you know, everybody likes to download data in Excel or R or whatever and work with it. That's one out of 20, 50, 100, right? Other folks just want, and they want sort of to be that much closer to an answer. Um, and so we had to stop building a product for people like us and build it for the vast majority of people. Um, and so I think that's what we've been focused on. Still a lot of work to do, but um, but yeah, I think you know if, if 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 somebody comes to you and says, you know, hey, like I used to do this manually in like an Excel doc, and I used to read you know 20 different newsletters and transcribe it, and you like have gotten rid of that, like you basically have a fan for life. So it's been a a big learning for the team and an adjustment for us to do that. Great. Do we have questions? In a classic newsletter selling business, uh, so I had one 12 years ago back in India, and uh, it scaled a little bit, and then it just stopped, and then I realized for it to scale further, I just uh, needed more manpower and more manpower, and my margins were just really flat out, and then eventually they just died down. There was immense competition. So two questions. Where does the moat come from? for your business, because in private space, like you said, Bloomberg for private, there's already a company called Privco, by Samad Hamade or something, his name is Samad mm -hmm. Hamade. And then second is, how do you bring scalability to this kind of business where you need more data scientists in order to keep making more use cases or more newsletters in order to find more applications? Sure, so it's a good question. So the newsletter is marketing for us, right? That's not really our business. Our business is we sell a data product like, you know, like the way Bloomberg does, and not not at quite the price point Bloomberg does, but you know our average ticket I think is around 35k a year. Um, so you know that's the biz that's the business, right? Um, in terms of the moat, right? I think we think the private markets are going to be a big space, right? And so there's going to be the Yahoo finances of that space, and there's going to be the Bloomberg. So you know we anticipate being the Bloomberg. Uh, so you know I think there's room for other folks, but. Um, you know, I think predictive analytics is really where folks want to go. It's people don't want a spreadsheet of 100 companies. They want to know which three they should focus on. And so I think that's, that's the moat, right? Is, that has to be good, right? You can't just say you do NLP and machine learning and data science and people believe you. It has to, it has to work. So. so you showed a graph of uh, JPM versus Goldman. And you also mentioned that uh, you don't normally work for free or uh, low-cost provider. Uh, how accurate is that data, and did you partner with the firms to generate that, or you got it from free sources like uh, Edgar Online or Yahoo Finance or anyone? Yes, yeah, so the data that we get is we have about 25% of our data comes now to us directly submitted from the acquirers or the investors, and 75% is programmatically extracted. So it's SEC filings or press releases or blogs or local, national, regional business publications. So you know we're looking at articles that say Goldman Sachs invested in XYZ company for you know $10 million on this date, and here's who's joining the board, and we extract those entities from those. So um, you know a lot of that data is out there now. Turning it into something useful is kind of what we're focused on. Hi. Um, so with your model, you know, you talk about how companies in the private sector don't want data on 100 companies, they want it on three, right, who just participate in their market. But how will the CB Insights platform get better data for them than just them talking to their custom own customers in the market, what they're hearing from their competitors, because obviously – you know, their competitors are probably talking to the same customers at the same time and then using those own insights to make their own decisions. Yes, it's not necessarily data driven, yep. but it is, it's a high degree of confidence um, on the data that they're gathering themselves. Okay, so you're talking about the sales kind of use case there? Or? I mean, it could be any use case. It could be sales, it could be actually um, you know, features and product, it could be um, you know, marketing, it could be anything, just the way these their, their, their private competitors are positioning themselves to the market, be it price, features, product differentiation, et cetera. 
Yeah, so I think the point here is that, one, we're not replacing the network, right? I think they're going to augment it. You know, I think having that conversation, doing that at scale is basically impossible, right? Like, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And I think the real brutal truth is people overstate the value of their network, right? We haven't met every VC, no offense to Matt, that we talk to thinks that they have proprietary deal flow from an amazing network of people oh, they we, know. We do. Except for, ex, <laughs> except, except for Firstmark, you know, and a handful of other funds, you know, they mostly don't, right? And I think First Round Capital actually had like an analysis they did of where their deals came from, and they realized that their best deals actually don't come through their network, right? So I think people generally sort of overstate, to be very frank, overstate the value of their network. Um, and then I think highlighting companies that are off the grid is incredibly valuable to you know whoever you might be. So. Time for one last one. Uh, I think you alluded to this in one of your slides, and also in some of the questions that you answered, but. Who would you say are your top three customers, and who would you say are your top three competitors at this point? So, I mean, customers, in terms of sort of personas or use cases, right, it's uh, corporate strategy and innovation, which I'll lump together. Uh, it's biz dev teams. And then the last is a big group of what I'd call deal makers, which would be bankers, lawyers, VCs, right? So those are kind of our three big use cases. Um, in terms of competitors, you know, we run into Dow Jones, we run into Thompson, we run into Cap IQ. I'd say from a credible competitor perspective, that's who we throw in there. And then, you know, it's a lot of money sloshing around right now, so there's a lot of like junk as well. But those are the big, uh, those are the real ones. All right. On that note, thanks very much. Thanks.